Our scripture reading this evening is going to be from Genesis chapter 15. We'll read the entire chapter. The next few weeks and the evenings, I will be focusing on different saints' encounters with God as we consider God revealing himself to men, making himself known to them, and recording these encounters that we might benefit and profit from them as well. So we turn to Genesis chapter 15. If you're able to, I ask you to stand for the reading of God's word. After these things, the word of the Lord came to Abram in a vision, saying, Do not be afraid, Abram. I am your shield, your exceedingly great reward. But Abram said, Lord God, what will you give me, seeing I go childless, and the heir of my house is Eliezer of Damascus? Then Abraham said, Look, you have given me no offspring. Indeed, one born in my house is my heir. And behold, the word of the Lord came to him, saying, This one shall not be your heir, but one who will come from your own body shall be your heir. Then he brought him outside and said, Look now toward heaven, and count the stars if you are able to number them. And he said to him, So shall your descendants be. And he believed in the Lord, and he accounted it to him for righteousness. Then he said to him, I am the Lord who brought you out of Ur of the Chaldees, to give you this land to inherit it. And he said, Lord God, how shall I know that I will inherit it? So he said to him, Bring me a three-year-old heifer, a three-year-old female goat, and a three-year-old ram, a turtle dove, and a young pigeon. And he brought all these to him and cut them in two down the middle and placed each piece opposite the other, but he did not cut the birds in two. And when the vultures came down on the carcasses, Abram drove them away. When the sun was going down, a deep sleep fell upon Abram. And behold, horror and great darkness fell upon him. And he said to Abram, Know certainly that your descendants will be strangers in a land that is not theirs, and will serve them, and they will afflict them four hundred years. And also the nation whom they serve I will judge. Afterward, they shall come out with great possessions. Now, as for you, you shall go to your fathers in peace. You shall be buried at a good old age. But in the fourth generation, they shall return here, for the iniquity of the Amorites is not yet complete. And it came to pass, when the sun went down and it was dark, that, behold, there appeared a smoking oven and a burning torch that passed between the pieces. The same day the Lord made a covenant with Abram, saying, To your descendants I have given this land, from the river of Egypt to the great river, the river Euphrates, the Kenites, the Kenizzites, the Cadmonites, the Hittites, the Perizzites, and the Rephaim, the Amorites and the Canaanites, the Girgashites, and the Jebusites. The grass withers, the flower fades, the word of God endures forever. Amen. May be seated. When we meet someone the first time, we would seek to know their name and to begin to get to know a little bit about them. But if it is someone that we have more and more encounters with, we begin to know them more. We discover their character, the things they like, the things they don't like, their strength, their weaknesses. And it is Abram who learned Something about the Lord God. Abraham had already had interactions with the Lord, who had called him out of Ur the Chaldees, who had called him to forsake his land, his family, and to go to a land that God would show him. And Abraham was faithful. He obeyed the Lord God. And as he had heard of blessings, that would come. He 
continues faithfully before the Lord, building altars, worshiping him. And it is in this chapter that God comes to Abram and that Abram encounters God again. This evening we want to think about that. What is it that Abram learns about God? that is revealed about God, that is of great benefit to him and to us, it is that God is a covenant-making God. That God binds himself to his people. And this evening we want to look at the God of Abram. And we want to think about the God of Abram's covenant. What we learn for God is the same yesterday, today, and forever, and therefore what is true for Abraham is true for us as well. God comes to Abraham, and it is God who defines the relationship. Notice the Lord comes to Abraham in a vision, saying, do not be afraid. He defines a relationship in terms of protection. He says, do not be afraid, I am your shield. And we think of how a shield protects, how it stands for that protection. And that imagery is used in the Old Testament in different places. In Deuteronomy, there is the reminder to Israel, who is like you, a people saved by the Lord, the shield of your help and the sword of your majesty. It is God who is their shield, their protection. It is David who reflects on that as well. 2 Samuel 22. You have also given me the shield of your salvation. So here is that protection. And this is the way that God defines the relationship. He says, I am your shield. Then he goes beyond. And he says, and you are exceedingly Great reward. Can you think of that? You think of someone that we admire, someone that we desire to be like. We think to receive a letter from them who, who we may not have much contact with them at all, to think we would get a letter from them, or perhaps a signed picture. An autograph, we think, here is something special. You think of how much people will pay for sports figures, autographs, to, to have a baseball that you caught at a game and have it signed by the person who hit that home run. And think of how much more special to be able to spend time with a person you admire and desire to be like. And you see, this is what God is saying to Abraham. I am your great reward. Not the stuff that I can bless you with. But I, I am your exceedingly great reward. He is calling Abraham and saying, this relationship, this is what defines my great blessing. And Abraham hears that. And God then also declares a blessing. He has done that to Abraham. He has promised that he would bless him. We think back of that call that I will make you a great nation. And Abraham looks and he, he thinks, how is that possible? I have no son. How, how can I become a great nation when I don't even have a single heir? And so he, he has shown his trust in the Lord. He has left his family. He has left his homeland. He has traveled where God has led him. And yet, he wrestles with this. And therefore, he brings it up, the Lord. Lord God, what will you give me, seeing I go childless? And the heir of my house is Eliezer of Damascus, a foreigner. Here's the question, but 
But God declares that blessing that will come to him. The Lord, the word of the Lord comes to him. This one shall not be rare. Not Eliezer of Damascus, but one who will come from your own body will be your heir. Here is the Lord blessing. This is the God of Abraham as he speaks to Abraham. And not only will there be an heir, but he reminds him, he takes him out and he says, look, the night sky. If you can count all the stars. Do children ever try to do that? To go out at night and to begin counting the stars? And you start counting and you get there and go, wait a minute, did I count that one? And you say, there's, there's more stars than I can count. And this is what Abraham hears from God. Your descendants will be more than all the stars that you can number. This is the promise of God. And then we have that response of Abraham. The glorious response, the one of faith. And he believed the Lord. He believed. He put his confidence in God. He looked at himself. He looked at his wife, Sarah. And he would not have thought that this would be the means of blessing. But he believed God. Man might have said, give up, Abraham. This is where he put his entire confidence. It was in the Lord his God. And it is this that is reflected upon in the New Testament. As Paul writes to the church at Rome, as he speaks about faith, not works, but faith. It is this that he refers to that Abraham believed. It was counted to him as righteousness. The imputation of righteousness because of that faith. And we see it here in Abraham, and it is set forth as God calls for it in Abraham. And Abraham responds in that faith. When we think about the things that we put confidence in, what is it that you trust in? That you say, here is my surety, my confidence. Our children, as they are young, they put their confidence in their parents. If their parents say it, they believe it. But we think as they grow that there are questions, there are others that they find out do not believe the same things. And there is a question that comes up, what will I put my hope in, my confidence, my trust? Abraham, despite all the circumstances, said, I will put my trust in the Lord. This would be his hope and his confidence. And we are called to do exactly the same. In every circumstance, that God will be faithful to his word. But what Abraham discovers of God is as he, as he comes to him, God gives him the covenant. The covenant whereby God communicates his commitment to Abraham. And this is revealed in, in a most wonderful way. It seems like sort of a strange procedure, thing that God asks of Abraham. And he says to him that he has to take these animals, to take a heifer, a female goat, a ram, and cut them in half. And he does that, and he lays the pieces, one on one side, one on the other, and he waits. He waits. He follows the direction of God, and he waits. Notice that this is God's initiative. It is God who enters into covenant. 
We cannot come to God and say, let me make a covenant with you. Let me make an agreement. It is God who initiates. And it is God's glory that is seen. In one way, it is negative. It is Abram, who, having chased away the vultures for a period of time, the sun is going down, a deep sleep fell upon him. And, and what is it that comes upon him? We read in verse 12, Behold, horror and a great darkness fell upon him. Here it has gone and pressing upon him. Abram, pay attention. Abram is, is realizing his weakness. That he is asleep. There is no enemy coming to attack him, but the oppressive darkness. And we see how even around the throne of God, that yes, there is the glory, the light, but for sinful men, there is a reminder that they in themselves are weak, that they are under judgment. And it is Abram who experiences that. You think of Places in the Old Testament where the presence of God reminds people that He is hidden from them. In Exodus chapter 20, verse 21, so the people stood afar off, but Moses drew near the thick darkness where God was. You see, man cannot penetrate to understand and know God, He must come to them. Psalm 97, the Lord reigns on the earth, rejoice, that the multitude of the Oz be glad, clouds and darkness surround him. Righteousness and justice are the foundation of his throne. And so Abram is reminded of his utter helplessness before God. But then we see that as God Rehearses what will happen to Abram's descendants. Things that you would say, well, where is the promise of God? That they will be strangers, that they will be subjugated to another nation for 400 years. But then God does something. As there is that understanding given to Abram. And it came to pass, when the sun went down and it was dark, that behold, there appeared a smoking oven and a burning torch. Here was light in the midst of darkness. And what happens? It passes between the pieces of the animal. And you say, what is going on here? This is so strange. And, and it is scripture that helps us to understand in Jeremiah 34, verse 18 and 19, we read, And I will give the men who have transgressed my covenant, this is God speaking, who have not performed the words of the covenant which they made before me when they cut the calf in two and passed between the parts of it. The princes of Judah and the princes of Jerusalem, the eunuchs, the, pri the priests, and all the people of the land who passed between the parts of the calf. You see, here was a commitment to the covenant. What was said in that? It was a very vivid picture. It was saying, let this happen to me. As I pass between these parts, let it happen. May this happen to me if I do not keep the covenant. If I am unfaithful to it. May I suffer this consequence. May I. Not you too. Lose my life. You begin to see the significance of what God is revealing to Abram. For there are the pieces on each side. But who goes between them? It is not Abram. It is not Abram that says, I will be faithful. I will keep the covenant. This is God. That 
represented in its smoking oven. That torch, it is gone or passes between the pieces. It is God saying to Abraham, I am the covenant-keeping God. I will fulfill my word to you. I give you this experience that you may have a confidence. You may be assured that I am a covenant-keeping God. This is what Abraham is seeking. Why do we take such great comfort in that? Because the covenant to Abraham is the covenant in which we participate. By faith, we are children of Abraham. We are part of those who receive the blessing of God. When we think of that covenant and how it was fulfilled, how it was fulfilled by Jesus Christ. For the curse of the covenant is not placed upon those who are descendants of Abraham. It was placed upon Jesus Christ. He suffered the judgment. He suffered death. He suffered the agony of the cross. That we might We, the recipients of the covenant that God makes with Abraham and with his descendants, with all who are united to Jesus Christ by faith, they encounter, they know this God who has taken upon himself to see that the covenant is fulfilled. And who bears the judgment that his people might be one with his son, Jesus Christ. And Abram has this experience. He, he hears the promise of God. He believes. And then God gives him this assurance. God is saying, I am the God of the covenant. I have entered into this covenant. And I will fulfill it. And as we think about the God who is the same yesterday, today, and forever, this is the God that you and I deal with. And this is the assurance we have as well that God will keep his covenant. And we do not cut pieces, animals in pieces, and have that, but what do we have? We have the remembrance of Jesus' death and resurrection. We have the sacrament of the Lord's Supper. That here, the judgment, the curse placed upon Jesus. That we might be forgiven. And so as we prepare this week to come to the Lord's table next week, meditate, reflect on this, and think that in the sacrament, we are reminded that Jesus has stood in our place. That he has passed between the pieces. That we might be forgiven. That we might receive all the benefits, all the blessings. For they are all yes and amen in Jesus Christ. All the promises of God. And Abram did not have great knowledge of how God would work all this out. He believed. And it was counted to him for righteousness. Even as when we believe in the Lord Jesus Christ, it is counted as righteousness for us. But we have the assurance that God will keep his covenant. That he will redeem me. That he will justify me. That he will glorify me. And we say, Lord, this is my God. This is my hope. This is my confidence. That God keeps his covenant. And therefore, we may face the world 
as Abraham would have to be, with unbelievers, with those who would doubt. And he says, I will trust in God. That he will keep his covenant. And he will bless me. And he will provide a city for me. Whose builder is God himself. You see, Abram understood God was his exceedingly great reward. He wasn't looking for a big piece of real estate for himself or his descendants. He wanted that permanent one. He wanted that city that God would build. God, indeed, was his great reward. We must see that that is our great desire. We have the assurance, and therefore we are to live that way, saying, my glorious reward is that God is my God, my salvation, my hope. Oh, what comfort, what strength, what blessing in that truth. Amen. Let us pray. Father in heaven, we thank you for the record in Genesis 15, revealing to us our covenant-making and covenant-keeping God. The Lord here is the source of our hope. And we, Lord, may see that covenant fulfilled in Jesus Christ, all the promises fulfilled in him for us who believe in Lord, give to us that awareness that even as we prepare to come to the Lord's table next week, that we may think upon that covenant that is rooted in the love of God, that is expressed in Jesus Christ, is the source, the fullness of our blessing, and of God is our exceedingly great reward. Lord, we pray with thanks in Jesus' name. Amen.